At first, the Soviets called it the elephant because of a drawing on its turret. But soon they learned its real name, the tiger. They'd captured one near Leningrad and brought it to a tank testing facility for trials. The results were alarming. The tiger's front armor was impervious to a Soviet T-34, even at a range of just 200 meters. Only heavy howitzers could destroy this beast. But that was on a firing range. At a gloomy meeting of the Stavka High Command, Marshal of Artillery Nikolai Voronov told Stalin, we have no guns able to successfully fight against these tanks. It was April 1943. Along the entire front, the Red Army prepared to meet what they called the Summer Germans. In both the previous summers, the Wehrmacht's Blitzkrieg had proved almost unstoppable. Now, these new German tanks caused fresh concern. Would the Red Army once more be swept aside by the German summer offensive? Soviet engineers worked frantically on new tank and anti-tank gun designs. Few would be ready in time. Meanwhile, the Stavka made plans to meet the inevitable German offensive. All eyes were drawn to the city of Kursk. Here, the Red Army's central front occupied a large bulge, or salient, in the front line. It was an obvious place to attack. The Soviet general staff expected the Germans to attack simultaneously from north and south to cut off the troops inside the salient. To meet this threat, the Red Army began to construct several defensive lines within the salient. The Stavka planned to let the Germans wear themselves out, attacking these defences, before launching their own counteroffensive. Soviet intelligence was soon able to confirm the Stavka's intuition. On the 12th of April 1943, Stalin was handed secret German plans for Operation Citadel. It was the code name for the Wehrmacht's summer offensive in the east. The information came from an agent codenamed Werte. His real identity remains a mystery, but it's assumed he was an officer within OKW, the German Armed Forces High Command. His reports were sent to Moscow via Rudolf Rösler, who headed the Lucy spy ring based in Switzerland. The plans for Operation Citadel exactly confirmed what the Stavka had already guessed. The Germans planned to pinch out the Kursk salient with two simultaneous attacks. They will be made by von Kluger's Army Group Center from the north and by Manstein's Army Group South in the south. At the beginning of May, the Stavka was able to warn its commanders that, according to our intelligence, the enemy plans to attack along the Oriol Kursk line, the Belgorod Obian line, or along both lines simultaneously. In May, Hitler held a planning meeting to discuss the early phases of Operation Citadel. However, many generals voiced concern. Field Marshal von Kluger, commanding Army Group Center, openly opposed the Führer. General Model, meanwhile, presented air reconnaissance photos. It was his 9th Army that was to assault the Kursk salient from the north. Modal pointed to the signs of heavy Soviet defences being prepared in this sector. Walter Modal would earn the nickname the Führer's Fireman, because later in the war he was frequently sent by Hitler to try and salvage desperate situations. Modal was a fervent Nazi, renowned for his loyalty to the Führer. In 1945, when his army group was encircled by the Americans, he shot himself rather than face surrender. Modal was one of a very small number of generals whose opinion the Führer respected. Modal was known as a genius of defence, but he and his 9th Army had less experience of large-scale offensive actions. Some thought that Modal was trying to get the entire operation cancelled, allowing him to fight a defensive battle against the Red Army.
Guderian was another who expressed doubts about Operation Citadel. As Inspector General of Armoured Troops, he knew that the Panzer Divisions were not ready for such a massive operation. For him, the whole thing was too much of a risk. The war had already taken a massive toll on the Wehrmacht. If Citadel was a success, it would allow them to retain the initiative on the Eastern Front. But if it failed, it would be disastrous. The Führer agreed to postpone the operation by one month, declaring, there can be no failure. The delay would allow the Germans to deploy more of their latest armoured vehicles. These included the heavy Tiger tanks, the new Panzer V Panthers, and the massive Ferdinand tank destroyers. The Luftwaffe was also receiving new ground attack aircraft, such as a fighter bomber variant of the Fokker Wolf 190. New variants of the Junkers 87 dive bomber were armed with two 37mm cannon. They fired tungsten core ammunition against the thin top armour of Soviet tanks and proved to be highly effective. Squadrons of new Henschel ground attack aircraft were also arriving in the Kursk area. The HS-129 was also a specialised tank destroyer. But the delay also gave the Red Army more time to strengthen their defences. Three heavily fortified lines were constructed, with minefields, trenches and gun emplacements. But the lack of effective anti-tank guns was still a serious concern. The Red Army hoped that new defensive tactics would overcome this shortcoming. Previously, anti-tank guns had been distributed evenly along the front but combat experience proved they were more effective grouped together. Anti-tank strong points became the foundation for the defence of the Kursk salient. Each strong point contained up to 20 anti-tank guns and dozens of anti-tank rifles. The guns were well entrenched and covered all directions. The distance between neighbouring strong points was 600 to 800 metres. If German tanks tried to pass between two strong points, they would expose their weaker side armour to the Soviet anti-tank guns. It took many weeks of back-breaking labour to build the strong points and anti-tank ditches. Mikhail Badijin, an anti-tank gunner, recalled we had to dig out about 30 cubic metres of earth to bed in a 45 millimetre anti-tank gun. We did more digging than most people will do in their entire lives. The Red Army dug 4,200 kilometres of trenches along the Voronezh front alone. If they'd been dug in a straight line, they'd have stretched from Moscow to Madrid. The Central Front had dug another 5,000 kilometres of trenches. 2,000 kilometres of roads were built, 686 bridges, and 300,000 wagon loads of supplies and equipment were delivered to the Kursk salient. The Kursk salient was now the most heavily fortified position in the history of warfare. Launched against it from the south would be the 445,000 men and 1,500 tanks of Army Group South. They faced the Voronezh Front, commanded by General Vatutin, with 626,000 men and 1,700 tanks. In the north, the attack would be conducted by von Kluger's Army Group Centre, with 332,000 men and 1,000 tanks. Facing them, the Soviet Central Front, commanded by General Rokossovsky, with 712,000 men and 1,800 tanks. In addition, more Soviet troops were gathered into a strategic reserve named the Steppe Front, under General Ivan Konyev. Rokossovsky's situation in the north was relatively strong. He knew the German tank assault would have to come from somewhere along a 90-kilometer gap in the forests. Vatutin's troops, however, were on the wide open steppe. There was nothing to restrict the enemy's movement. They might attack anywhere. 
General Nikolai Vatutin was considered one of the Red Army's most talented commanders. His peasant origins and communist fervor made him a favorite of Joseph Stalin. He was a theoretician and highly respected by his adversaries. German generals nicknamed him the Grand Master. Vatutin would not survive the war. He was killed in an ambush by Ukrainian nationalists in February 1944. General Vatutin's Voronezh front was about to face one of the most powerful military assaults in history. Vatutin, by nature an attacker, would be called on to conduct the greatest defensive battle of all time. As the Red Army prepared for battle, the engineers got to work. A dense minefield was laid around each strong point. The second and third lines weren't mined so heavily. Instead, they were assigned mobile engineer units in trucks and horse-drawn wagons. Their task was to lay minefields on the fly, in the very path of advancing enemy tanks. A German general wrote, the speed at which they could lay a minefield was astonishing. The Russians planted more than 30,000 mines in just two or three days. Meanwhile, Red Army recruits were being trained to overcome their fear of tanks. They were sent into trenches and run over by their own tanks. They called it ironing. They were also trained to throw anti-tank grenades and Molotov cocktails. And in the evening, they even read pamphlets on how to destroy German tanks. The Red Army scoured its artillery units for the most accurate gun layers. The best became anti-tank gunners with improved pay and rations. They trained hard until they could pick out the weak points of a tank and score a bullseye on the gun. Batteries of powerful 85mm anti-aircraft guns were assigned to key sectors, with orders only to engage enemy tanks. Four regiments were armed with German anti-tank guns captured at Stalingrad. The Red Army Air Force also received new anti-tank weapons. They had been attacking with one big 50-kilogram bomb, but it was difficult to score a direct hit on a moving target from the air. The new bomblets weighed only 1.5 kilograms, but could penetrate up to 100 millimeters of armor. Since tanks have much thinner armor on top, this was easily enough to knock out any German panzer. 48 bomblets were packed into one container. A Sturmovik ground attack aircraft could carry four such containers. It was enough to devastate an entire tank column along a path of 200 meters. As the wait for the German assault to begin dragged on, some Soviet commanders became increasingly uneasy. Vatutin repeatedly urged the Stavka to attack first. We must seize the moment, he said. The enemy is not attacking, autumn is coming, and all our planning will have been in vain. Let us stop digging and launch our attack first. But the response was always the same, wait. Meanwhile, a German map was recovered, which accurately plotted all Soviet positions as spotted by their air reconnaissance. Many Soviet units were forced to move. This time, they paid more attention to camouflage from the air. For the third time, the Stavka issued a warning to the troops that the German attack was imminent. But by now, false alarms were beginning to play on the nerves of frontline troops. Lev Maliki, a scout with the 222nd Guards Rifle Regiment, wrote, It was clearly believed that the Germans would attack soon. All units in our division were on high alert. We were ordered by division intelligence 
to take a German prisoner for interrogation at any cost. That night, they captured a German engineer who'd been clearing mines in no man's land. Under interrogation, he began to speak freely. German troops have been put on full alert, he told them. They will begin to attack in the direction of Kursk on the 5th of July at 2 a.m. European time. There will be an additional assault from Belgorod. The hour was not far off. The Red Army planned a nasty surprise for the Germans. Just as they massed for the attack, the Soviets would hit them with a massive artillery bombardment. The night sky was lit up with the blast from hundreds of guns. Not all of the German assembly areas were guessed correctly, but the deluge of shells and rockets found many targets. Other German units found it impossible to advance into this wall of fire. Lieutenant Roshenko, navigator of an Ilyushin 4 bomber, recalled, from a long way off, we could see that something unimaginable had begun along the front line. Both sides were firing intensely. As soon as the Soviet guns fell silent, the air was filled with the scream of German shells. This barrage was intended to soften up Red Army defences ahead of the assault. The scout, Lev Maliking, remembered, the sound of explosions made us leap from our plank beds in our dugouts, grab our submachine guns and race into our trenches. Fire, smoke and falling earth were everywhere. The enemy bombardment lasted more than an hour. At last it ended, and the Hitlerites began their attack under the cover of smoke shells. Tank divisions, air fleets, infantry units, all the military might that had been assembled around Kursk over the course of several months was now set in motion. The largest tank engagement of all time and one of the greatest battles in history had begun. July 1943, the long-awaited German offensive at Kursk had begun. Radio-controlled tankettes led the way, sent ahead to clear paths through the Soviet minefields. Their heavy-toothed metal rollers detonated all the mines in their path. Others laid powerful explosive charges that could clear a large area with a single blast. These machines cleared the way for the Ferdinand tank destroyers, but it wasn't always easy to spot the safe lane across a field churned up by countless explosions. Many Ferdinands lost their way and were disabled by anti-tank mines. By the end of the first day, half of the mighty Ferdinands were out of action. Most had been immobilized by damage to their tracks and wheels. In the south, heavy Soviet shelling hampered German attempts to clear the minefields. Many Tigers and Panthers soon had their wheels and tracks shattered by anti-tank mines. The Germans also ran into 500 kilometers of anti-tank ditches. The ditches had to be collapsed by accurate dive bomber attacks before the tanks could pass. The famous German Blitzkrieg had been reduced to a crawl. German units became caught in a labyrinth of Soviet defences. As soon as they suppressed one strong point, they came under fire from its neighbour. General Friedrich von Melantin wrote, the Russians were excellent at camouflage. 
No minefield or anti-tank strongpoint was detected before the first tank was blown up by a mine or the first Russian anti-tank gun opened fire. However, German experience and firepower soon began to tell. They began to concentrate all their effort against a few narrow sectors of the front. German panzer units attacked in a V formation. Its tip was formed by the heavy Tiger tanks, which took out Soviet anti-tank guns at long range. Medium and light tanks followed. When the Germans had succeeded in smashing a hole through the defences, they rushed to exploit it. Army Group South was supported by almost 400 aircraft on the first day of the battle. They rained bombs onto the Soviet strongpoints. They also bombed minefields to clear lanes for the advancing panzers. It took 17 hours for the elite 2nd SS Panzer Corps to breach the first line of Soviet defences. General Vatutin responded by sending in Katakov's 1st Tank Army. Katakov recalled a report from one of his brigade commanders. Berda began his report. The enemy was attacking his position incessantly from 50 to 100 tanks at a time. Tigers and Panthers came first. Dealing with them is difficult, sir, he said. You shoot at them, but the shells only ricochet. So what's the outcome? Losses, terrible losses, sir, about 60% of the brigade. A Soviet T-34 tank had to get within 500 metres of a Tiger and then fire at its thin side armour. The German Tigers and Panthers, meanwhile, could penetrate the T-34's front armour from a range of two kilometres. The huge losses sustained by the first tank army forced Katakov to share his concerns with General Vatutin but there was no change of orders. As he prepared for another suicidal assault, the phone rang at his headquarters. It was Stalin. He asked Katakov to speak his mind about possible courses of action. Katakov proposed digging in the tanks and letting the enemy come into close range before opening fire. Stalin was silent for a while. All right, he said at last, you will stop the counterattack. Katakov's tanks took up defensive positions alongside the artillery and infantry. But when General Kravchenko's 5th Stalingrad Guards Tank Corps was threatened with encirclement, Colonel Nikiforov arrived at his headquarters with special orders from the army commander. He would shoot Kravchenko if he did not order an immediate counterattack. Kravchenko's counterattack ran straight into the heavy tanks of two SS Panzer divisions. With half of his vehicles destroyed, he was barely able to fight his way out of an encirclement with the remnants of his corps. Meanwhile, in the northern sector, General Rokossovsky also ordered an armoured counterattack. On the second morning of the battle, near the village of Olkovatka, General Rodin's second tank army was ordered to attack. The counterattack failed to dislodge Modal's panzer divisions. Later in the day, they attacked once more through heavy thunderstorms. Advancing against powerful and accurate German gunnery, the Soviet tank divisions took horrific losses in men and machines. But they did manage to blunt Modal's advance. The second tank army went on the defensive. When a fresh German panzer division renewed the attack, it ran straight into the camouflaged Soviet tanks. 
The ruined train station at Ponnery became the focus of heavy fighting. The Germans gathered their surviving Ferdinand and Brumbar self-propelled guns into a task force and attempted to storm it. German units managed to get behind the Soviet troops holding the station. But now they found themselves in one of the Red Army's pre-prepared fire pockets. It was here that Sergeant Mikhail Fermin, a gun layer of the 159th Guards Artillery Regiment, was awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union for destroying seven tanks. He continued firing even when wounded. The fire pocket was a tactic used by Soviet anti-tank guns working together to lure German tanks into an ambush. Some guns would act as bait, opening fire at long range and drawing the enemy tanks towards them. Once in range, camouflaged anti-tank batteries on their flanks would open fire. At a range of 200 to 300 metres, there was a good chance of a kill. Modal's 9th Army had failed to achieve a breakthrough at either Olkovatka or Ponary. By the fifth day of the battle, the northern offensive was running out of steam. Rokossovsky had accomplished his task of exhausting the enemy. Now it was time to think of attack. On the telephone to Stalin and Zhukov, he was given the date, the 12th of July. While the enemy had been held in the north, in the south the battle was entering its most critical phase. Here the Germans had more room for manoeuvre across the open steppe. And despite heavy tank losses, they had broken through the first two Soviet defensive lines. The Red Army rushed reinforcements to the area of the enemy breakthrough. The Germans had 200 Panthers at the start of the battle. After five days of fighting, they were down to just 16. The new Soviet anti-tank aerial bombs were an unpleasant surprise for the Germans. Just one hit could destroy a tank. But the Waffen SS Panzer divisions leading the charge were experienced, determined and tactically skillful. Strong point by strong point, they fought their way into the heart of the Soviet defences. The breakthrough into open country appeared imminent. One Soviet operations report stated, the circumstances that allowed the enemy's tanks to advance were these. As our tanks and trucks retreated, they were pursued so closely by the enemy that it was impossible to lay anti-tank mines on the roads to hold them up. One communist youth member serving with the 287th Guards Rifle Regiment wrote later, on the night of the 11th of July, we reached the Oktyabrsky collective farm. We were told there will be a battle tomorrow. Dig trenches. There will be either your fortress or your grave. To prevent a German breakthrough, the Stavka used its strategic reserve to reinforce the Voronezh front. More than 400 tanks, hundreds of other vehicles and thousands of infantry were on the move through the arid heat of the Russian steppe. Boris Nazarov, the loader in a self-propelled gun, recalled, We were on the move all night and all the next day. We had all our hatch covers open, but it was still unbearably hot inside. The commander forbade us to lean out of the hatches, so inside we were practically naked. Ratutin planned to use these reserves to deliver his long-awaited counter-attack. General Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army was due to take up positions near the village of Prokhorovka. This was to be the base for its assault. But the 2nd SS Panzer Corps had already reached Prokhorovka. Here, they were poised to break through the last Soviet defences. 
they had only been held here by a miracle. As tanks of the SS Panzer Division, Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler had rushed forward, they'd been hit by enfilading Soviet artillery fire from the far bank of the Puschel River. Concern about their exposed flanks would delay the Germans just long enough. The Leibstandarte Division took up defensive positions, waiting for the SS Division Tortenkopf to cross the Puschel and secure the flank. Meanwhile, Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army was approaching Prokhorovka. The Soviet tanks maintained strict radio silence. Their approach remained unknown to the Germans. But when the sun rose, German air reconnaissance soon spotted the multitude of vehicles and alerted their own troops by shooting violet flares. The 5th Guards tank army was due to attack on a narrow front between the Pachelle River and the railway. The front was further restricted by an impassable ravine. The Soviet tank brigades would need to form up in columns to attack through this narrow gap. Soviet tanks usually attacked en masse across a wide front. When an enemy gun fired, several tanks immediately answered back. Attacking on such a small frontage would be a severe handicap for the Soviets. But there was no hope of the orders being changed. Shortly after dawn, the 5th Guards tank army launched its assault. Helmut Becker, commanding a regiment of the SS Division Totenkopf, wrote, I saw clouds of dust on the horizon. Soon, out of these clouds, Russian tanks began to appear. The Russians have sent in their reserve, I said to our chief of staff, and realized that we had lost the Battle of Kursk. But events at Prokhorovka were far from a foregone conclusion. As the Soviet tanks rounded the wide ravine, they were funneled into a narrow channel where they made easy targets for the German gunners. Tank after tank was hit, bursting into flames or being torn apart in massive explosions. Tank commander Brukov remembered, tanks were ablaze everywhere. Powerful explosions sent five-ton turrets flying 20 meters into the air. Some explosions were so powerful that an entire tank was blown into a pile of scrap metal. As the tank battle raged around Prokhorovka, the thick black smoke from countless burning vehicles turned day into night. Soviet losses were terrifying, more than 300 tanks in a single day. In the pulverizing engagement, neither side emerged as a clear victor. But the implications for the Wehrmacht were obvious. Paul Hauser, commander of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, immediately began to withdraw from Prokhorovka. Operation Citadel had failed. There had been no breakthrough. That same day, two Soviet fronts launched an offensive against the northern face of the Kursk salient. The operation was codenamed Kutusov. The goal of the operation was to destroy German forces around Oriol, including Model's 9th Army, leading the German offensive. Powerful artillery bombardment signaled the start of the operation. It was so effective that the initial Soviet advance was almost unopposed. But as the advance continued, the Germans began to fight back. 
Modal realised the threat. Units engaged in the Kursk offensive were hurriedly redeployed to reinforce his defences. He directed the Luftwaffe to attack Soviet tank formations advancing from the north. The famous Stuka ace, Hans Ulrich Rudel, led the attack. He wrote, My aircraft was armed with anti-tank guns. Other Junkers armed with bombs followed me. I destroyed four tanks in the first attack. By that evening, my score was up to 12. To cover Modal's retreat, German pilots flew several sorties a day. Rudel Stuka was shot down near the town of Bolkov. He made a forced landing, but was back in the air in a fresh aircraft two hours later. The Soviets began to repel our airborne anti-tank attacks quite successfully, he wrote. This was because they learned to bring up their anti-aircraft guns alongside their lead tanks. Soviet fighters were also in action. It was over Kursk that Ivan Korzydop, the Soviet Union's top-scoring fighter ace, brought down his first enemy aircraft. Ivan Korzydop was a triple hero of the Soviet Union by the age of 25. He wasn't shot down once in the entire war. He flew 330 missions and brought down 64 enemy aircraft, including one ME-262 jet. It's rumoured that his victories included two American P-51 Mustangs, which had attacked his unfamiliar aircraft in the belief it was German. Meanwhile, down below, Soviet tank reserves had arrived to bolster the offensive. Tanker Nikolai Zheleznov was in the thick of the fighting. He recalled, the German defences on the outskirts of the village consisted of anti-tank guns and dug-in tanks. I destroyed two guns and one tank during this engagement. I shot at it twice and it went dead. It was due to our driver, not me, that we crushed the two guns. I just told him over the tank radio, Misha, to the right, a gun. After we ran over its carriage, I noticed another one about 10 metres away. Crush the other one too, or it will turn round and hit our stern. The Red Army failed to encircle the German troops around Oriol, but Modal was forced into retreat. Eventually, he was able to regroup and dig in at the Rojev line. By the 5th of August, the Red Army had mopped up the last pockets of German resistance in Oriol. Vatutin's assault against Army Group South took much longer to materialise. It was a full three weeks before the Voronezh Front had regathered sufficient strength. But on the 3rd of August, Operation Polkovodets Rumyantsev was finally launched towards Belgorod and Kharkov. The SS Panzer divisions had been redeployed to the Donetsk Basin. Therefore, the German line was considerably weakened. Achieving a rapid breakthrough, Katakov's 1st Tank Army and Rodmistrov's 5th Guards Tank Army advanced swiftly towards their objectives. On the third day of the offensive, Red Army forces liberated the city of Belgorod. On the 5th of August, the roar of guns was heard in Moscow. The salutes, the first to be fired in Russia's great patriotic war, honoured the liberators of Oriel and Belgorod. The Soviet troops now advanced on Kharkov. On the fourth day of the operation, lead units of Katakov's 1st Tank Army broke into the town of Bogodukov and crossed the Poltava Kharkov railway branch. It was there that they were hit by von Manstein's counterattack. He had scrambled together all the reserves he could muster and thrown them into a desperate battle to hold Kharkov. The Soviet vanguard was forced to fall back to Bogodukov. Meanwhile, Konyev's steppe front was advancing directly on Kharkov. The Germans had turned the city into a fortress. 
a frontal attack would be disastrous. And so, 5th Guard's tank army was ordered to make a flanking manoeuvre to threaten Kharkov's defenders with encirclement and force them to retreat. But now, Rotmistrov's old friends, the SS Panzer Divisions Das Reich and Tortenkopf, returned from the south and immediately attacked near Bogodukov. At one stage, General Rotmistrov received two contradictory orders. One from Vatutin, demanding he defend Bogodukov. Another from Konyev, demanding his troops storm Kharkov. It triggered a heated discussion at Rotmistrov's headquarters, involving the army commander, his chief of staff, and the military council led by Major General Grishin. You have to come to some decision, sir, Grishin told Rotmistrov. To which he replied, I've decided to hold my positions until the situation is clear. But, sir, we could be put on trial and shot for this delay, Grishin said anxiously. If we leave our positions and the Germans capture Bogodukov, we will certainly be shot. It would expose the entire left flank of the Voronezh front to enemy attack. Fortunately for him, Rod Mistrov's decision proved to be the correct one. His army played a crucial part in repelling the German counterattack around Bogodukov. Soon, Rod Mistrov's 5th Guards tank army was also able to support Konyev's troops by advancing on Kharkov from the west. The Germans' only line of retreat was in imminent danger of being cut off. Hitler demanded that Manstein hold Kharkov at all costs. This would mean the encirclement of the whole of Army Detachment Kempf. Manstein was not prepared to risk another Stalingrad. On the afternoon of the 22nd of August, Soviet air reconnaissance reported that the Germans were pulling out of Kharkov. Konyev launched an immediate assault. The city was liberated by noon the following day. It was a triumphant finale to the Red Army's great victory at Kursk. General Guderian wrote in his diary, with the failure of the Citadel offensive, we suffered a decisive defeat. Needless to say, the Russians exploited their victory to the full. There would be no respite on the Eastern Front. From now on, the enemy was in undisputed possession of the initiative. Operation Citadel was the last large-scale German offensive in the east. Now the Wehrmacht began a long retreat. In their wake, they left a devastated country. Hundreds of Russian and Ukrainian villages were burnt to the ground. Crops were destroyed. Bridges and railway stations were blown up. Any villagers capable of work were shipped to Germany to be used as forced labor. The Soviet troops were marching to liberate Ukraine. Here, on the banks of the Dnieper River, the war of liberation would begin. <laughs>